questions, but after that, thank you to start Sorry. recording. Yeah, uh, and I'll be on that. Uh, we'll let you share screen and discuss um, your uh, work. Uh, can you share a screen? Can you verify that works on your end? Or if you need to for slides or Oh, we're doing that. Uh, yeah, cool. That looks like it works. Yep, that's working perfectly. Um, Bobby, uh, I have one thing at some point, maybe before we dive into the main stuff to talk about too. Oh, no, okay. So you, you're saying you want some time? Yeah, like less than five minutes. That's totally fine. Uh, do you have any slides, Jason? I, I was just going to literally do it through our, uh, show people our Gen 5 Bootcamp website. And oh, that's what I was going to do too. Oh, okay. I'll, I'm going to steal your bit then. I, yeah. Okay. Do you, okay. Go ahead. I might interrupt you as you're going. Oh, yes. Please do. Okay. I will just. Yeah, I guess it's, we can start pretty much now. Uh, give me. Okay, uh, just for those, I noticed there's a lot of new people in the chat. We uh, do record these sessions. Uh, these do go up on our YouTube page. Uh, so just, I think it's correct to know that you are being recorded. Uh, we just use these for reference and to, yeah, if we have any meaningful discussions about general Gen 5 development. We have these monthly, just pretty much a town hall sort of meeting for people to talk about Gen 5 development work, as long as it's Gen 5 development related, uh, emphasis, not on asking us how to use Gen 5 for your research, actual development work, anything goes. Uh, so here at UC Davis in the past month, uh, normally I would have a presentation of uh, that involves slides telling us what sort of development we've actually done. This has been a kind of a special month because we had the Gen 5 boot camp here in Davis. We've had one of these before. Essentially, it is uh, mostly uh, early stage PhD students who are invited to UC Davis to attend a five-day course, six hours a day, learning how to use Gen 5 from literally the first set, one of the first sessions with me explaining how Python works and how to use Python, all the way up to how do you model RISC V ISA instructions using an out-of-order out of CPU core, uh, and even more complex stuff than that. So, uh, We've been talking about this the last few sessions. It was broadly successful. And these materials that are available at bootcamp.gen5.org uh, serve as an archive of the event. We're also going through and fixing various typos and things because we want these materials to be a reference and a tutorial for, let's say, anyone who didn't attend the bootcamp and for anyone who wants to learn more about Gen5. There's also recordings. Uh, Ivana, are we still, have we still not got the recordings uploaded? Or... They're not up yet, but we'll be in the next week or so. Every single one of these sessions has a recording that has a live demo of tutorials, coding examples. Uh, uh, I, the, I think that's overstating it a little bit. Um, it is, we, we kind of recorded things. Some of them worked, and they will be on YouTube. <laughs> but I would, but I would, I would not count on them being great resources. I would say I'm going to re-record re some of my segments that were a bit choppy, but and I'm uh, I am working with Ivana to try to make these uh, slides a bit more followable, able, followable, uh, as uh, kind of more tutorials. Um, just for high level overview for anyone who wants to distribute these materials, we have broadly high uh, high level introduction, pretty straightforward. We made those down to using Gen5, i.e. just kind of configuring uh, systems through the Python config script, then more into developing, that means adding your own simulated components. Like let's say you want to make your own uh, uh, core model, uh, that was that there. 
uh, from the University of Wisconsin and in collaboration with AMD, we have worked, we have a GPU model in Gen 5 and that was covered by Matt Sinclair. And Jason at the end talked about uh, integrating other simulators with Gen 5, uh, particularly SST, which is a simulator that's better at modeling nodes in a cluster, basically. I think that's a correct uh, interpretation and how that how you can integrate that with Gen 5 and have Gen 5 simulating what's going on in one of the nodes while having SST modeling the uh, higher level node architecture. Um, so that has been, that was last week or I'm getting mixed amount of dates. That was uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've been doing that and we're cleaning up materials as we speak. Uh, as you know from the last uh, Gen 5 developers meeting, we have version 24.0 out and we're now planning for version 24. Uh, and you now we're planning for version 24.1. Uh, I guess uh, if anyone has anything uh, they would do. Yeah. Sorry, Jason. Uh, so, sorry, I, I had more I wanted to say about the bootcamp. Oh, okay. I'll let you talk about the bootcamp before I talk about the release. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, we, Bobby's showing you the website here that has the um, slides that we used. These slides have um, lots of detailed code examples, and all of these should work. Um, they're, yeah, they should work. Um, what goes along with this is a bunch of materials that we developed, so a bunch of like code templates to put in. To, um, on the slides, we have things to fill in with the templates to get you going. Can you go to the... A uh, repository, please, Bobby. Sure, github.com, uh, Gen5 Bootcamp 24, this one? Yeah. OK. Uh, so in this repository, this has um, all the slides, so all the source for the slides on that website. Um, and then it also has um, the materials um, that we used. So these are code examples or code templates that then we fill in in the slides. Um, so if you want to go through the slides, it's important to kind of have this repository um, next to as well. Um, so this is what we used for the 2024 bootcamp, which we need to kind of tag and mark as being the version for 2024. Um, we will probably create or like uh, merge this back into the main repo and then start working on that for improvements. Um, but this will be here as a snapshot for 2024. Um, yeah, I don't know. Are, are there any questions or anything about the bootcamp? Um, I, I guess before I let people ask questions, uh, one of the things for everybody on this, uh, all the developers on this call that I want to um, emphasize is uh, we want these, re like the bootcamp isn't something that we want to keep like just at UC Davis or anything. This is very much something we want to push all of these materials out to the community and have anybody take these materials and either run their own boot camps or at least point new users of Gen 5 to these materials. Um, so everything is available and if anything doesn't work, feel free to create an issue or something and we can try to improve things. It's completely open source as without anything else, you can use them. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, this you can create a pull request just inside. Ivan is currently, for instance, going through and helpfully fixing my titles and my slides, which is always much appreciated. Uh, I also say, uh, well, I find it really useful. Uh, all the slides are in markdown format, so they're readable as raw text as well, which I actually quite like. Uh, but maybe that's just me. Uh, yeah, is you had nothing else, Jason, to talk about? But I don't know. Are, are there any questions or anything or any uh, comments on? Bootcamp stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, Bobby, you can continue on then. Um, sure. Uh, I guess since I'm already in GitHub, I'll just go to the Gen5 repo. So uh, we did release version 24.0 last uh, month, and uh, we are now planning for version 24. Point one, which will roughly, well, we will probably release in early December, uh, certainly before the end of the year. And uh, I guess end developers in the meeting, in terms of how we allocate our time and what we prioritize and maybe what we should be aware of, this is really the time to uh, 
create issues or feature requests inside uh, the issues page to uh, make us aware of things that might help you in your research or you think needs done. So just like an example here, add these GPU tests, for example. Uh, I'm currently going through these issues and uh, uh, you know, kind of triaging them and seeing what would be good fit for us to get into the next release. Uh, but we really like to get community input. You know, we only see the project from a certain perspective. And if anyone's used this and has pain points and has more helpfully maybe uh, ideas on how these pain points can kind of be addressed, we'd love to hear. Uh, but again, it doesn't have to be right now. You can do it later, easily get into the next release. And everything noted on GitHub is GitHub is kind of forever. Uh, even if we close an issue because uh, maybe we don't have anyone to work on it, it's still there and we can always reopen it. Uh, we reference these quite a lot and we go back and see what people said. So that's really all I wanted to say on that. Uh, that's going to be our focus for next month. Um, and that is really all I wanted to say about uh, the Gen5 project development here at UC Davis. Um, does anyone... Uh, have any Jam 5 related development discussion they want to bring up in this meeting? Um, I don't know who's exactly in this call besides uh, me and Jason. Uh, you speak up. No, that's fine. Sometimes these meetings can be, uh, you know, not have very much stuff to discuss, and that's fine. I take that as a sign that we're doing a really good job and no one has anything to talk about. Uh, okay. Uh, Karin, is that how you pronounce your name, Karin? Um, yeah, uh, I'd love to hear what you prepared for us and hopefully we can give you some, feed uh, some feedback and uh, yeah, let's hear it. Thank you. So uh, a, part, a part of me, um, wait, first we'll maybe we, we uh, oh. change the share screen sharing. Oh yes, uh, thank you, how do I? I... Oh, okay. there. Right. So, um, let's see. No, it's not working that way. One second. I think I now messed up the. Um... Jason, are you still recording? Oh, wait, sorry. Yes, you are. I just yeah. see the recording. Okay, cool. Um, I hope it works. Um, um can you see is it mm, i don't see I... you don't okay no, let's see. share yeah go for it. Yeah, that's it okay oh i s used I, i'm what do you see like i see i am connecting with two screens so i'm actually not... uh, a title slide entitled search this towards reliable jam 5. yeah but you don't see the whole because i see i don't know why it does it to me there's there should be an option. Do you want like one monitor to show up? Because I think there should be an option. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't. It's just very confusing. Um what? No, not this. Um, try stop sharing your screen and when at least in mine, when you click the share screen, you get various options that are kind of hard to interpret, but one of them is just the monitor. Um, yeah, I think do you see just a whole full screen? I'd see a slide. A whole, uh, yeah, okay. I was just ignore that screen. <laughs> Look here. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So I, um, what I want said that uh, a part of me today, also Bill from UCL, is here, um, and we did this work with uh, more people from UCL and and Kings, uh, which is Aidan, uh, Hector, and uh, uh, Justina, um, and so the idea is to so we talk about automated testing, and I think. A lot of time people think like, oh, okay, I wrote a lot of tests and it can run automatically. Um, but the aim of this work is to create many, many tests, kind of like to, to snowball Gem 5. Um, and these tests created automatically and then automatically find if, um, yeah, like the test pass and, and the simulation is acting as, as expected or something went wrong on the way. Um, and it's quite challenging because Gem5 is, is, is large. Usually when we create these automated te um, tests and snowball, um, it's usually a small program or some software that the input is not so complex. 
Um, but here the input notice is not, not, not so, not, no, not just just simple text, it's binary file with some input sometimes and so on. So um, we have the, the problem is much more complex when regularly we talk about automated testing. Um, so there are two, when you think about automated testing, there are two ways we can like generate a lot of input to, to snowball gem five. Uh, we have some like generative approach that out of thin air create a lot of, of uh, let's say binaries, which is <laughs> quite hard. And there is another way that that mutate binaries. So you get some binary as as an input or some way that later you can create a binary out of it and then mutate it, and then you get a new input and then you can try and that's that's how you create a lot of this um, test. Um, one thing when we are talking about Gem5, we want it to be valid because yes, it can be that maybe the compiler will, you know, somehow I create invalid um, binaries and the common case is that I, the binaries are valid and something wrong uh, is going in Gem5, not the other way around. <laughs> um, so that's that's quite a challenge when we are mutating binaries to can keep I, valid. Can I ask a very quick question here? That, uh... yeah. When you talk about this in the context of Gen Five, are you are these modifications to the uh, like like what what are you modif what would you modify in this case? Is it like uh, Gen C plus plus unit tests or is it configuration scripts? Um, is that yeah. so? So for now, we are taking. Um, I will explain what exactly we did, but for now, we are changing this part. The the, the binaries that we're sending to Gem Five. But like, could could you do you have an, an example of a binary you send to Gem Five? Like, a, uh, a, yeah. I have a lot on. I have a lot, and I also kept my terminal open <laughs> so I can get. Uh, I we even have like in the end, I put an example of a binary that we did a lifting, so we can see what exactly the mutation was. Um, it's so true. Just, just to, so, sorry to interrupt. So, so to um, clarify, so these binaries coming into Gen Five are like "Hello World" or "Matrix Multiply" or whatever we're going to simulate on Gen Five, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you have that's... some sample of, uh, uh, um, like, you know what kind of output uh, input you can get. Like I explained how we build it, but we have an automated way to understand what inputs they can get. So it's much more easy. So you can also, if you think of it, the binary, but I want to get to it in, in another slide, but just the high yeah, level, we have some hello word. Um, and, and then we can mutate things here. And then we send it to Gem5. We keep Gem5 as it is. Um, and then we check uh, semi-automatically, because sometimes you do need a lifting and inspection. If... Um, everything is okay, or we suspect there is a problem. Um, but the, the, so one of the problem, of course, why we, we care about um, uh, valid binaries, first of all, it's not interesting. And second of all, uh, second, second is that um, it will only test the, the, the front end of Gem5, only just test if, you know, you get the, the, uh, some bad memory, if something, if it can catch it or not, or something like this, or something completely corrupted will it run or just you know print you an arrow and we don't want what what we want is to actually go to this part and if we don't get a lot of valid binary this part will not be tested like deeper part of gem5 will not be tested um so there are so thinking of the approaches we do combine both of them so we use we combine llm and afl and i explain llm is large language model and that they can create us um, test out of thin air but then llm are not very um strong if it's not something like it only helps if it's something related to language like human language or code um like c c plus plus it will not give you like binary code at a good uh, you know, at a good quality that you can try to 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 create, a, I don't know, to flat it into a binary and run it. So, um, so what we're doing with LLM, we ask LLM to, I don't know, we give I will give you a set of end programs from source X. Uh, that's what does the beginning. Um, you can play with a bit with this to do a bit of of uh, prompt engineering to get it completely out of thin air when you don't even give like a test suite. But at the beginning, we gave um, the end program where the LLM, LLV, uh, LLVM test suite. And then we asked the LLM to generate us a program uh, and give uh, an example input and the type of the of this input. 
So I don't know, five, six, and seven, and all of them are eights. Um, and then we send it to AFL. Um, I don't know how much, um, I, I assume AFL is, is um, quite a, a common uh, fuzzing tool, but uh, if not, um, it gets a target, which is in that case, uh, Gem5 uh, instrumented with some, you know, some extra information AFL can um, write on and, and, you know, understand how to, to navigate the search to find um, interesting test case. Um, and then it, it tried to find a, a new crush and a new hangs by doing some mutating, some mutation to whatever input you define it is. Uh, and AFL found a lot of security bug. Uh, this is mainly it's, it's what it's famous for. Um, yeah, if, if you have more questions about AFL, I can answer. Uh, if at some point you feel it, it's missing uh, to understand the, the work. So we, we take the, what we got from, from, L, from LLM, uh, which are the program from the LLVM test suite. We create, uh, we uh, build them with, I don't know, GCC with the minus O3, just to make things fun. Then uh, we wrap them as, as, a, as a test input for um, AFL and we create a lot of them because again, we want to snowball I, Gem 5. Could I be very, could I be very, could I ask, could I have a quest? Uh, can you give uh, just a hot, because I have kind of forgot for my PhD, what I know it, uh, American Fuzzy Lop, it mutates code that is makes basically changes, but what is the purpose? Is this so the tests detect the, the like, mutation that this is the logic here? Like they say, you have changed the code in a bad way, but this test covers it. It's a test coverage tool. Yes, it is. It, it's not necessarily bad. It's either add coverage or crush. Um, and you have a way also to to create a more sophisticated. But we didn't inject it here because I felt. Um, I think I want my opinion. If you so, there is a way to do. Usually, it's it goes coverage or crush and hangs. There is a way to do coverage or crush and hangs or uh, some mismatch or you know, not sensible result or something like this. But I think if you go to that direction, unless you have a very good reason, it's, it gives you like a very, it damage your throughput. So you don't want to do it because you're going to have less um, test, new fuzz test in the end, which no. you want much more because because I do the next slide and, and then maybe it will be. Um, so we combine both of them, but the next slides actually, um, maybe if we're already here and, and there, you're already familiar with, with, with the uh, AFL. So it goes like this, we have LLM give us um, a lot of programs. We compile them as some binaries. We send them to the queue of AFL. AFL then try to use our custom mutator that are sensible in sensible in such a way that most of the time that they will trick the test, they will not break everything. They will just, um, I don't know, change a letter from, uh, uh, I don't know, from from a letter to a number and see what happened, or a number to a letter, and then maybe it's bad, maybe it's not. Okay, um, I, I really feel like I need, I'm a little bit confused on, again, these input corpses here, because my understanding with the Marin Fuzzy Lobe is you want to modify code in Gem5 as a way to test the quality of your generated tests. Is that statement true? No, that's the, that's, so this is mutate, this is the, so there are two ways of treating mutation. So there's like, um, you want to mutate, so you, you want to mutate the target or you want to mutate the input to the target. Um, and you're and the input here it is like because we I, I'll say what I think why uh, maybe me and Jason kind of have similar questions is we think of inputs to Gem Five as being configurations like configured that defines and they're Python files that define how a system is set up. So when you say you've got these compiled sources, you can specify in your configuration that this configure this specific uh, simulated system runs a Hello World binary, for example. And if you're mutating that in American Fuzzy Law, is this just a way to uh, basically gen like um, have more like Hello World binaries that maybe sure. protect it? And that, so you're just trying to get as much coverage on basically uh, input software to a simulated system. 
I'm trying to get more coverage on the source code of Gem5. So I will try to get as many instructions as I can covered. So it's, I, I think, but you're uh, you're really focused on instructions here. Like, cause when we, we think, I think when we think of coverage in Gem5, we'd say, like if your simulated system doesn't have a GPU, you're never going to be able to cover the GPU code in Gen 5. Because uh, and mm -hmm. if you buy input binary, you'll you're you're still never going to get there. So you're really this research is really concerned with how you test the Gen 5's uh, instruction implementation for various ISAs. Yes, I think uh, one thing I want to say about the configuration. I think the configuration. Um, Generally, a lot like if I want to, if I am this, for instance, the the first batch of bugs we run it on x eighty six, and now we're trying to run it on ARM. Um, so we can still compare the result because you can log everything uh, between what happened with with you know changing the configuration to work for eight x eighty six, and changing the con these you can like enumerate all the tests you generate, and change the configuration uh, file to see if you get a bug um, and it can be sensible to try to collect. So this, this um, what we're doing at that stage here, we only just aiming to get this fuzz corpus. We actually, at here when we are fuzzing, we're not trying to get the bugs yet because the interesting bugs is not what AFL is generating because AFL probably the, the, the crash usually that it generate um, is usually usually just like, you know, uh, corrupted binaries. So maybe oh. sometimes it is an interesting case because I don't know, uh, some corrupted binary caused to a ha cause a hang and, and nothing is, I don't know. Maybe it can be like a very strange scenario when it is interesting. But I, most... I, I think I understand. I, I would like to let you continue. Okay. But I, I would just say as like a very high level thing, if you're presenting this elsewhere, is mm -hmm. that you, I don't, I think when you say improving coverage in Gem 5 code base, that's not actually what this is doing. I would say you, you are creating test coverage for the implant, the ISA implementations in Gem 5. Yes. And, and that's, uh, but I understand it from that point of view, and that's fine. Uh, if you have, like, if there is other coverage, other way to improve coverage, um, I'm also, that's interesting. Maybe we can have this discussion after I finish the, the presentation. Uh, but it's also interesting to think like what how do you see coverage and what is interesting interesting from your point of view because it can be with a small modification we can also get this because the test uh, the way we are building it's not it's not really we are sending this one we are sending much more complex tests um because if we just send binaries to afl afl will do will make completely nonsense and also you won't be able to have like good custom mutator you need to send actually quite a lot of information anyhow. So sending a bit more parameters is, is not a big deal. Um, but yes, may, maybe we can we can keep it for the for the for the uh, talk afterwards. Um, so talking about what we are sending, yes, at the beginning we, we, we get like some program, but this is not very interesting um, in terms of what test we can generate because we get this and the only thing we can do is maybe change the numbers here and we don't have a lot of flexibility. So what we're usually doing, we, we're going to parameterize even the C program. So we will have control over what's going on in the code and what inputs uh, we are getting. And hopefully um, you can get some optimization that kicks in or don't kicks in from the C, like if you compile it with C and then, um, I don't know, to make things much more interesting, we are adding input from the outside and it also helped to diversify. And um, one interesting thing is if a picks on it and sometimes find um, like instructions that only the very end of the, the you know, the very, like the very, like um, the smallest numbers causing troubles or something like this, which you will never find if you just try to, to stick with this version. So the first step is to get a program, parameterize it so we can play later with the values to find all things with, with the same implementation. Um, and then we call it a template. We figure out also, we, so LLM also give us the type we need for it. And um, 
and, and we have the type, we have the example input, and we have uh, the program, we, we compile it, so we have a binary. Um, and yeah, and, and once we have this binary with all the data, we can actually uh, send it to uh, to gem five. So we will have like the binary, we have five int. Uh, and, and then we can start also doing things to this binary. So we can do, for exa example, bit flip. Uh, we can also decide that this, instead of five, we will try to do minus 200 and see what happens. And then we get kind of slight different version. And then um, by having a lot of this, it looks like a small modification, but each of modification is possibly can expose something wrong. Um, so yes, I said before that we are looking for crush and hangs during the fuzzing, but this is not the main uh, reason we are doing it. What we do in the end, we have like a fast corpus and then we can run it on whatever target we want. So we can pick uh, ARM or we can pick some chipset that is not yet explored and start to see what happened if we run the simulation against the native run. And then we we, we have, uh, of course, if, if it's, if uh, I don't know if, if it makes sense, maybe it's a feedback you can give, but usually what we do, we run x86 against a simulation of x86, and we are not doing cross-platform, but maybe under certain condition, um, it is it, it is something sensible. Um, so once we're doing this, this um, uh, um, cross-check, we're checking if we have some mismatch. And if this mismatch is not because we did something very nasty with the memory that doesn't completely make any sense, or, or things that are obviously like the binary is corrupted, even if it looks like running, okay, it's corrupted. Um, if it's if in that case, we said it's a mismatch because um, it can be that the simulation uh, returns zero and uh, the native returned five, and then we know there is something wrong. Um, and sometimes it requires examining the binary. So how we do this process, so we get the fast corpus, um, we select one of the, the uh, uh, new fuzz test that we created. We send it to the simulation and we run it on the hardware. And then we, we cross check the result. And if there is a mismatch, it indicates that maybe there is a bug and we start investigating further. Um, we did the valuation. We, we had one paper already published and we have another paper being prepared now. So it's a mixed result from both papers. Um, we did quite a lot for the, this part paper we have over 700 days of uh, various input corpus and the corpus and, and uh, um, we mainly check what happened, like the differences if we change the, um, the input that we give at the beginning, what, what LLM is generate uh, to see the effect on the coverage on GEM5. Um, so I have a quick, quick uh, question. Uh, I think I know the answer, but I, I just wanna make sure. Um, so all of this fuzzing, um, all the changes you're making is to the C code, and then you run a compiler on that, or are you actually changing the binary? We are actually changing the binary. Okay, gotcha. So we have, originally we created the C program. We actually can create like, it can be like one of our future work is to also change the C program. Cause you can, you can decide that you keep some link to the original C program and then you can also have a mutation that changed the C program. But it's a different uh, cell space. Like if you change the binary, you get different, like your, your options are different than what you, if you change the C file. But for now we are changing the binary or we're changing the, the input to the binary or we're changing the type that we define the input to the binary. Okay, cool, thanks. And um, so we run quite a lot and we're still analyzing the result. Um, but we got quite a lot of bugs. And then um, I think this is um, what I wanted to show you and, and get your feedback. Um, and I also get very, very happy to get feedback regarding uh, the coverage and um, what kind of you know, mutation we can introduce to other you know, possible input to GEM5. Um, so when we try it originally, we only use uh, ChatGPT, but then we were thinking to try um, 
different model. Um, for instance, the small model are very good to create uh, programs that um, can lead to serious uh, security issues. So if you run this program, you might uh, corrupt all your terminal memory or something like this. Um, so we tried six of them and we got quite a lot of uh, bugs. Some of them are related to unimplemented part of that there's some unimplemented command um, in gem five. Some of them are mismatch. Uh, some of them are panic error. I don't know if, if, for instance, these kind of things are very interesting. We get also a seg fault. Um, you see that all of them kind of, of give the panic error, but not all of them giving the mismatch and the unimplemented. So it's kind of really a question. And it's for instance, the small model is quite expected because we know that the smaller the model is, the more likely it will create code that you don't really want to run as is. So there is quite a lot of research that small language model are very bad in terms of security if you try to run it. Um, for example, uh, there is like some warning about some floating um, floating point um, uh, floating point uh, 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 instructions. Um, Things related to memory, I assume here. Yeah, things related to unimplemented things that are related to time and date. That uh, the date is always like fixed in Gem Five. Um, things related to complex number. Uh, watch R, which is something we are looking at, and and probably the support is is not. I like this is quite hard to analyze um, and to get a. Uh, um, to get a, a, an example that is free from undefined behavior at the sea level. Um, I'm not sure if it matters, by the way, maybe we, we can give you a binary and it is with undefined behavior and it's not that bad. Um, system command is not always working. I assume it cannot always like LS probably bring nothing back or so. Um, and we run, by the way, all this we run on the emulator mode. We didn't do a full system yet. Uh, so maybe this this is also related to this. Um, and this was only when we used the LLM. So it was pre fuzzing bug. So we only did the analysis, what happened if we use only LLM to get bugs. We have, um, uh, on the previous paper, we finished the analysis. Uh, but this one, we, by the way, we already reported. And um, I think there was quite a positive um, reaction to this bug. Um, it was a subtraction of two um, long double numbers that gave odd result. Um, and this is pre-fuzzing. Post-fuzzing, we are also, so one question you can ask. Sorry, can, is, can, I, can I ask a little bit about some of these errors real fast? This one or this one? These. Yes, okay. So this so, we have C file. Here we still have the C file because they are pre-fuzzing. Gotcha, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh yeah i think so, so i'll ask one question and give one piece of feedback so, so my question is um for other things that you got panics mm -hmm. did they work on hardware yeah so i never uh, so what i was filtering if we if it was crashing on the 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 the, the hardware uh, on the native one i just we don't dig, like we filter everything because the aim was mainly to try to find mismatches when everything works okay on the hardware, but it can be that the hardware is like kind of um, got some more mechanism to, um, if something is a bit, no, but it's can be because we don't, we didn't fuzz yet. Yeah. So yes, they work on the hardware. Yeah. That okay. Be... That's interesting. I'm a little bit surprised about some of these unmapped addresses working on hardware and not in, in the software. Um, but oh, that's interesting. That seems like these are bugs. Um, the other thing I'll say is like, I think it'll be interesting to see your results on ARM um, mm -hmm. because we are highly aware that our x86 implementation is not very functionally correct. Um, it's usually functionally enough correct, but mm -hmm. uh, especially when you get into some of the floating point things and AVX and some of the less used x86 instructions, we know that they're implemented incorrectly. Uh, I have a question. If um, regarding ARM, if I'm using uh, Raspberry Pi, it, if I have version four and version five. Um, 
is it okay? Does it matter? Shall I uh, stick with the five or I can use both machines to, to try it or there is no difference at all between them and this is the same chipset? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if uh, Giacomo or Richard have an I idea mean, on that. I mean, uh, in my opinion, as long as you're basically uh, running Cisco emulation, it should be it should be fine. But I mean, I didn't check spec of uh, this Raspberry Pi, but I think it should be fine as long as you're in Cisco emulation. Then, of course, like situation changes uh, when you're running full system. That's my initial impression. Yeah, but I want to know if I can count on the result from the Raspberry Pi in its native mode. Like if I directly run it on the hardware and I get some result, I get five. Is it a, like, can I trust this five? Or it might be a slight different. Like if I just do ESA ARM, Oh, probably there's a the slight different flag for 65. I mean, I mean, I mean, so the the difference that can make is uh for the sort of uh, release of the particular CPU, and this is something that you will have to tweak in the configuration. And when I mean configuration, I mean like term five configuration, right? So you can basically um tweak the implementation of the CPU to support a specific uh, ARM release, like whether it's like ARM v8.3, ARM v8.4. So. Okay you would, might have like with your fuzzing and I'm not sure I understand fully like the extent of the fuzzing on what you're actually fuzzing. But for example, it can happen that um, you have an instruction, you know, an ARM instruction, which is um, not implemented in, um, in, in Raspberry Pi CPU and whereas it is in Gem5 or vice versa. Um, that does not necessarily mean it's a bug. It's just like a sort of uh, misconfiguration. So that's something you need to be you need to be aware um but in general we can help like if you for example if you want to match a specific architectural um uh, release um we can help you that there is like a way to actually uh select that in gem5 so you make sure that um your host um you, you're basically mimicking the host um and this is something that we sometimes do like for kvm for example so i think like it's a similar pro uh, problem in a way if if I if you can help or I don't know who who from ARM can help, it would be a great. Um, because yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm finished to build Gem Gem Five on the Raspberry Pi, um, and yeah, I'm, I I don't think I will be able to fuzz there, but I definitely will be able to because the fuzzing takes quite a lot of memory. That's one thing, but I'll be able to take the tests that were generated and try them. But do you really? I mean. Do you really need to compile Gem5 on Raspberry Pi? Can you just, um, well, I guess it makes it deep. Well, I mean, you could basically just run the binary natively, maybe. Uh, and compare it to what and, happened to the x86. And, and, then, and then run Gem5 on um, whatever other machine. I mean, there might be some subtleties which I'm not considering. Uh, yeah. The only problem with running Gem5 on another machine in SE mode is you could pick up on different uh, libc. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which would be confusing. But if you could, you know, get a, you make sure that you're using exactly the same version of the cross compiler or GCC. Mm -hmm. um, then it you could compile good. statically, I guess, on the Raspberry Pi and then Use the Even statically code. compiled, you still dynamically link to uh, glibc. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder because no, I think I think it it's not a problem to build uh, Gem Five. I think it's not a problem. <laughs> it was it was building, um, but I didn't test it to see if everything runs and and the result is sensible. But it's it's okay to build. So what I was planning is to build Gem Five. So I built Gem5 on, on one of my Raspberry Pi and Raspberry Pi 4. And then I can just take all these tests. So it's bef this is pre-fuzzing. I will deal with the post-fuzzing later. Obviously, it's also interesting to, to fuzz because then I have I I, I, I will have maybe I can create a Docker. Uh maybe I maybe Docker I can would be fuzzing. very, very useful in this case. Yeah, maybe I can create a Docker and then um yeah, maybe I can like say like 
wrap the environment somehow for ARM as a Docker and put it on a stronger machine, which is not necessarily a Docker, uh, an ARM. Uh, and like I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm trying to, to think, but yeah, maybe some, some virtualization can help here. But I was, the, the first straightforward thing I was thinking is to take the pre fuzzing, uh, pre AFL fuzzing stage, because there is already quite a lot of bugs here and, and try to see if we get the same um, issue with, with ARM or not at all. Like how to, to technically to, to duplicate this experiment, this table, um, also for ARM and just compare, see what, what this, because this, this, behind this, I have like a specific seeds. So to take all the seeds that I got from LLM before fuzzing, and this I can just build, you know, get the same uh, compiler and, and, you know, make sure that everything is the same and um, just see what, what the table looks like. If I still get this panic error, for instance. Well, I'm sure you're going to get different errors. Um, so I really want to hear about the fuzzing results. Um, but uh, just one other really quick thing about running this on ARM. So um, you can use faster ARM machines than Raspberry Pis. Uh, both Mac OS should, or like the, the new M series Macs should work. Um, and also uh, if you were to use um, AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, they all have ARM machines that you could use. Ooh. Way faster than a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, but I'm not sure you can do this call emulation on uh, on a Mac on Mac. Um, oh, maybe 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 you can. I don't know. That's a good point. I think the fuzzing will be uh, maybe the like I I don't think that the test will take very long on a Raspberry Pi because these are very small binaries. But the fuzzing maybe that's a good solution, even if there will be a bit. Even if, as long as this binary will be able to run later on another ARM machine, like that, I will be able, to, like you know, you if to move them around to the same, if the, the, the CPU and the glib version and all of this is the same, um, then it's okay. If not, then you know this is a problem. But maybe I can, I can do. Um, I'm I'm not sure because um, not all of this platform allowing you to run Docker inside properly. Even if they allow you, you know, it's not like at some point there, there will be some error with the memory or the space and and, and so on. Um, but yes, that's, I was thinking to figure out the um, the, the the fuzzing stage later on, but first to try and see. But I was not sure any of this is interesting bug from the point of view of, of for the developer, like what you think about it. Um, so you said actually the panic error, if I find it with like, C programs that I can, you know, can I because here we still have the, the the source attached to the binary. This is actually um, quite interesting. So 18 and 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like your your school emulation, and uh you can probably get like something like undefined instruction or or no, I see divide error. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I yeah, I that. think the 16 and 17 are the or I guess 15, 16, and 17 are the most interesting to me. Those look like they could be bugs, um, mm -hmm. whether it's bugs in the implementation of the instructions before these addresses get accessed or something else. Um, those would be yeah. the first ones I'd be interested in. I mean, I, you know, Jason knows this too, so I didn't want to, you know, dwell on it. But I will say the errors with sixteen and seventeen in particular. My group with x86, we see them all the time, and basically we just treat them as if they're seg faults. And Jason's right; sometimes there's a bug in the application, but sometimes there's, you know, some instruction somewhere that calculates an incorrect address or something and and leads it down this path in Gem Five. But unfortunately, they're kind of just like catch-all things that don't really tell you where to go look. You kind of have to get a a bulky trace and like hunt it back. So it's it's good that it's catching it, but it's not good in the sense that it doesn't tell you what to go fix. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I assume, by the way, some of this panic error related to the fact that this long language model create unsafe code. So it can be like a really nasty seg for their doings. So that was the other thing I was going to bring up to you. I, I missed the first 20 minutes of this meeting because I had a previous meeting run long, but are the LLMs trying to run on the GPU model in Gem 5 or where are they running? 
Um, no, uh, it is just, uh, they're not trying to run on, on, on Gem5, they are separate. So at the beginning, we, we ask LLM models to just generate us a lot of programs. So you can uh, take uh, okay. example. We give example from test suite or um, what we did next is, is without even programs. We can just say like, we know that these instructions, so give us something that will exhibit um, okay. I don't know, vectorization. So, okay. uh, and when you compile it, and then we assume that if something happened with the vectorization, there will be certain um, instruction used, and then we test this implementation of these certain instructions. Never mind. What I was going to say then is the underlying like hand tuned assembly that that these LLMs use, like when they run on CPU and GPU optimization, like you know uh, kernels, mm -hmm. like in real BLOST libraries. They do do borderline unsafe things, which are often not implemented in Gem5. For example, in the GPU model, they do these crazy optimizations to save like one vector register out of like thousands, but apparently that helps them with performance somehow. Um, so I thought that's what you were saying, is that they were using these underlying BLOST libraries, but it sounds like it's actually the generated code, not the, yeah. the underlying code. It's, it's actually quite dangerous and and the, the, like it came to the point that tiny llama uh, if we try to use so what we do once we are fuzzing we take this uh, set that uh, all the tests that LLM gave us and for each of them we kind of like a bit sanitizing it um to get to, it's good for from the perspective of fuzzing because it takes less memory to load all the tests and to compute stuff. <laughs> But also from from the perspective of of what the the target get like C, um, it removes all these very old security um, issues in the test inputs. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe sometimes it is interesting, but I feel there's kind of a different work, and it's also stop completely the ability to continue the testing. So if you have something like this, very like you likely will crush the machine completely or stuck the machine and you have to reboot everything. So we got to the, like, if even if I wrap it, we did like this, we put Gem5 in a Docker, Docker inside a virtual machine, a virtual machine, we access it via terminal and we still had to reboot everything. So, um, so I think my conclusion, unless you're specifically looking for security issues, I, I, will, I will use, I will remove this kind of test and, um, yeah, it can be. I don't think we reported we add to this table this kind of test because they're they're quite nasty even to test. So if you think it's hard to 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 understand the panic error, uh, once you get it, it's it's very nasty to try to understand where it's coming from. These very odd security issues, um, sneaking into the LLM code samples. Yeah, like I said, ultimately, when you get those, all you can do is just get this big trace and follow it back and. It's no fun, but that's the only way I know to, to make it work. Unless you get blue screen in the middle or so. Well, yeah, yes, that's... that would be even worse. <laughs> um, I don't know how I, I've taken over and I apologize, but I don't know how you feel, Jason, but probably if it were me, I would recommend fixing like 18, 19, 20, and maybe 15 and seeing if those resolve 16 and 17. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I mean, we have three minutes left. So unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have a lot of time to discuss how Sorry. this tool could be useful for the community. But yeah, that sure, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I will try to, to so I can dive into it and send a report. And, and OK, um, I wanted, you know, before, so we got also similar panic, much more panic error once you're fuzzing. Um, this is already published, so you can have a look. And I think uh, I tried to, I, I report one of the hangs here, but I want to show you um, just before what the mutation are doing. So this is a lifting of a bind. So we did fuzzing, we got the result from AFL, um, and then we did lifting to the code to see what exactly changed. So what did, did this thing, like what the mutation here did, they, they changed um, the value of memory. So, which is nice because I was thinking they would just like, I don't know, override the fact that we are doing a printf and then we get illegal printf, but no. Um, we, we actually managed to keep kind of the instructions, okay, but it's kind of like 
did a lot of you know nasty things, editing memory or changing um, a variable into a specific memory address. Um, so this thing caused to a mismatch. We couldn't, uh, the mismatch was the native print this result and the simulation printed this result. And I can send you the, um, the slides maybe later on, or, or if it's recorded, you can look. Um, but it's mainly related to the, the change. So the bug when we investigated it related to the, to the printf, which uh, variable you're trying to print in this printf, which a bit change. So the green is, is the original code. Uh, because we keep some, we can we can know from, from which um, original program you started. Um, so we can trace the version. So we start with program, compile it to a source code, to, to a binary, and then you take, 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 you, we have all the versions. So we know to connect it. Um, yeah, so maybe I should stop now, but thank, thank you for all the feedback. Yeah, thanks so much. This is really interesting. Um, I definitely think that, uh, Know, ha having some kind of tool like this that could help us with buzzing um, would be really useful. I think that um, it's uh, really interesting. Um, on x86, it kind of scares me because I know there's so many bugs. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Um, but definitely for ARM and for Risk Five, I think it'll be um, oh, okay. really useful um, potentially Ooh. for tracking down bugs in the uh, in the ISA implementation. That's, that's pretty cool. The, the ARM, it, it doesn't really matter which version, like which specific, because there's like tons of models. Yeah, we can, I, Giacomo, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we support V7, V8. Yeah, V7 and V8, is that right? Uh, yeah, more specifically V8 until I would say V8.5. Um, yeah, from V8 till V8.5 and V7 we also support, but um yeah let's say v7 in v8 until v8.5 oh so now i need to to to, to understand what i have okay <laughs> we'll have a look and then um it's not documented very well but this is something that we should probably put on our to-do list um but we support most of the standardized um risk five extensions so um yeah we have a ridiculous string of what we support cool Okay, so we're a minute over. Does anybody have um, any final questions or anything else? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, um, Karine. And yeah, that was really uh, super interesting. Thanks so much. Thank you so much too. Okay, cool. Um, so well, we will see you all next month. Oh, sorry, Giacomo, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say thank you. So we'll see you all next month. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.